senior here at McKendree. He is majoring in human resource management uh, and he is exploring the possibility of going to law school, but he has started on his MBA here. So Evan, please take over. Uh, thank you, Professor Ulrich. Thank you all for being here. I hope you're doing well. This is What's Next? Career Coaching Strategies for Decision Making. So what's next? This is a question that comes in a variety of forms like, where are you going to school? Or what do you plan to do with your life? What job are you going to have over the summer? But at its core, what's next is a question that everybody's asked. And we get this question from family members, from friends, from mentors, from advisors, from everybody. And it's a difficult question to answer. For me personally, I came to McKendry as a business major, um, wanted to kind of go into financial services, but didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do. And I ended up switching my major to human resources uh, at the end of my sophomore year, but I still didn't really know what was next, what I really wanted to do, where I wanted to end up. And it's a difficult process. And this quote by Barry Schwartz, the author of The Paradox of Choice, Why Less is More, or Why More is Less, is a perfect summation of why choice is so difficult. He says, learning to choose is hard. Learning to choose well is harder. And learning to choose well in a world of unlimited possibilities is harder still, perhaps too hard. Now, this is a quote I'm sure many people can empathize with. These life choices, career-changing choices are extremely difficult. And they can't just be made on a whim. A lot goes into that. And the career coaching process is kind of how you start choosing what you want to do and answering the question of what's next. So career coaching serves as a bridge between current uncertainty, trying to answer that question, what's next? And at the end of the bridge is future decision-making as a way to evaluate decisions on the way through. Now, this can be used at any stage of a career, whether you are just leaving high school, just leaving college, whether you have an established career and you decide that you wanna do something differently. This is a perfect opportunity and perfect kind of method for uh, career exploration. Now, when evaluating career coaching, it's difficult because there are so many possibilities for people, so many career options, so many school choices, so many majors, so many different choices in life that the rule of three is a perfect way to kind of eliminate some of those choices and at the same time make the information more manageable. Now, you can see in this picture here, uh, this is a Big Mac meal from McDonald's, which perfectly summarizes the rule of three. You have French fries, you have a drink, and you have the iconic um, McDonald's Big Mac. Now, the rule of three is perfect because as you can see in this picture, it's appealing and it's something that's easy to remember. Now, the rule of three started as a Greek rhetoric strategy, but modern researchers have found that the rule of three perfectly sums up the way that humans remember information in chunks of three. And so how can a rhetoric strategy developed by the Greeks be implemented into a career coaching strategy? Well, Dividing information into three chunks makes it more manageable, easier to remember, and it's the perfect way to explore information without limiting it too much. So the areas of research that I personally have looked into during the career coaching process are personal competencies, which include uh, the ONET uh, profiler, uh, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, and the Guilford Zimmerman temperament survey. Additionally, you have networking, so the process of networking, uh, how to connect with others and how to interview them through informational interviews. And once you have this information, how do you analyze it to use it to the best of your ability? Lastly, you have market data, which includes economic data, uh, non-monetary compensation, and geographic factors, all of which play a huge part in decision making. So first, you have personal competencies. Now, the ONA interest profiler uh, is a self-assessment um, that helps people analyze what they enjoy in a work setting and how that can impact their decision making. The Myers-Briggs Types Indicator is a personality test and the Guilford Zimmerman Temperament Survey is similar to the Myers-Briggs in the fact that it's a personality uh, self-assessment, but it differs and it, it covers different topics. But within personal competencies, self-assessments are extremely important but they're also difficult. The issue is it requires people to introspect and to be honest with themselves. And in being honest with themselves, 
that is the best way to achieve the most accurate results that then allow for the best career exploration. So first with the ONET interest profiler, it begins with the question, what do you want to do for a living? And this is a question that, like I mentioned, is part of the question, what's next? A question that we can't seem to get rid of throughout our lives. Now the ONET interest profiler uses a 60 question uh, self interest inventory that is work related and covers activities that you would find in a professional environment. Um, then the interests are divided into six complete sections, realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, and conventional, as you can see in the example. Uh, and each of these are used as a way to kind of shape uh, interests and shape how they can impact career decision making. Now, in addition to these interests, you also have job zone levels, which as you can see here, in conjunction with the interest profiler, they yield results that provide best fits, provide great fits, and provide other examples of potential career fits. Now, job zone one is little to no educational preparation, and it's almost the most basic level of jobs that somebody could find, where on the other hand, job zone five requires extensive educational preparation. And there are a variety of options in the middle, but these two are the, the ends of the spectrum. Now, after assessing and receiving these results, each career has a hyperlink that allows people to explore them even further. And one of the aspects that ONET provides are knowledge, skills, abilities, and other, also known as KSAOs. Now, in this example, you can see that the knowledge type listed by ONET uh, on the left, they, they include a variety of topics, and these are only a few of the uh, tens of knowledge types, skills, abilities that ONET provides. In the middle, you have a personal rating. So this is another type of self-assessment, another way to be honest with yourself and really delve into what you're, what you're best at and what you can improve on. Now, the two uh, columns on the right are the best fits from job zone five using the interest profiler example from earlier. Now, this provides an opportunity for people to compare how they currently stack up to what's expected in each of these jobs, what skills or, or knowledge and abilities are needed to be successful. Additionally, the use of color coding makes the, the ability to easily look at these uh, Excel sheets and these comparisons, it makes it extremely easy. Now, you also have the Myers-Briggs type indicator, which evaluates four different preferences uh, extroversion versus introversion, sensing versus intuition, thinking versus feeling, and perceiving versus judging. Now, this is a pretty common uh, personality evaluator. Personally, I'm an ESTJ. I'm sure many of you have also taken this, but you're given a four letter combination. There are 16 total, but the four letters provide uh, a summary of how you interact with others, how you prefer to go about your daily life. And these uh, Myers-Briggs type indicator preferences reveal your workplace preferences. So they can help guide career decisions. They can point people in the right direction and guide them towards potential jobs. Uh, for example, if you are an ESTP, you might be better suited to be a detective or a banker or an inter in entertainment agent. Or on the other hand, an INFJ personality type might be better suited to being a therapist or a counselor or a social worker. But in the end, these types are merely used as guides and not concrete uh, classifications. You can certainly go outside of your Myers-Briggs type preferences. Lastly, Zimmerman survey evaluates uh, a person's personality on 10 distinct scales that are different from the Myers-Briggs type indicator. And these patterns reflect emotional intelligence, which includes the ability to notice, identify, understand, and manage emotions. It also deals with self-control and interpersonal communication, all of which are extremely important in professional environments. Additionally, 71% of hiring managers say they value high emotional intelligence over IQ, as many people 
have stated in, in recent years with its increased popularity, emotional intelligence is extremely valuable in the workplace. Some people say IQ or intelligence will get you a job, but it's the emotional intelligence that allows you to turn it into a career and pursue uh, your, your professional goals. Now, as emotional intelligence has become more important, so is networking. Uh, networking is the experience of interacting with others to create opportunities, to uh, learn more, to broaden uh, knowledge bases, to advance faster, and it also leads to increased status and authority in the workplace. Now, the Harvard Business Review in an article in 2016 lists three different strategies for increasing networking opportunities. First, you have focusing on learning. So this is a change in a mindset where instead of viewing networking as a necessity, as something that you have to do, see it as an opportunity, as something that you are able to do, something that you are given the opportunity to do, as an opportunity to learn, to gain more experience in the workplace. Additionally, identifying common interests. This refers to not only business-related interests, but also personal interests. Uh, for me personally, as a baseball player here at McKendree and as a lifelong baseball player, this is an easy way to connect with somebody on a more personal level. And while many of these networking opportunities are business related, developing that personal connection is also extremely important. Lastly, think about what you can offer. Now this is difficult because you have to consider tangible and intangible aspects. Tangible aspects include money or include other resources that could impact someone, but intangible, as, intangible aspects are also extremely important for junior level employees, especially students just entering the workforce. Gratitude is a huge intangible asset to use when networking with others. Additionally, the use of generational trends or market trends are important because they are something that maybe only junior level employees can, can offer, can, can provide information on. And so during networking, these are important aspects to consider. Now, how do we connect with others? The use of personal, personal spheres, personal social connections. So friends, family members, mentors, professors, advisors, all of them can help connect with others and can provide opportunities for these networking uh, conversations to be had. Uh, personally, I asked my mom if she could help me with this. And she reached out to a colleague that she's had for 20 years who was able to provide me with information on part of this. So you never know where these connections can be found. They don't necessarily have to be with professional, uh, people in your professional sphere. They can be within your immediate social sphere. Uh, additionally, you have services like LinkedIn, which provide web and, and app-based connections that help people as technology advances also create these connections. And the most important part of connecting with others is expressing your goals and expressing your interests so that people can help you, so they understand your situation, so they understand how they can better help you. Additionally, you have informational interviews. So once you've connected with people, gaining information that, that these people have is extremely valuable to your career coaching process because it can provide information that isn't readily available, latent information that only people through experience and through their own personal knowledge have gained. Uh, one important consideration is professionalism. So this includes your language. This includes uh, communicating effectively and communicating in a timely manner, but it also includes being prepared. This includes setting a time and a date for an interview and being punctual. This also includes preparing for an interview, which would be developing thought-provoking and open-ended questions. Researchers have found that people enjoy talking about themselves, so having the opportunity for a person to express their, their own experiences and their own knowledge is extremely important. Additionally, you have the appreciation aspect, so thanking someone for their time, expressing your gratitude. You can do this through phone calls, through emails, uh, handwritten thank you notes, which have become increasingly uh, more difficult to find, but still have an incredible impact on people. Next, you have note-taking. Uh, informational interviews provide an extremely large amount of information, and note-taking, making sure that you 
write down the essential information, information that can be expanded upon later, that can lead to impromptu questions, that can be relayed back to the interviewee to show that you're actively listening are extremely important. And lastly, after interviews are conducted, analyzing the information that you gain creates an opportunity to learn even more. And after multiple interviews are conducted, you're able to look at trends that span industries, span jobs, and make better career decisions, more informed career decisions, and make this information more manageable. Now, lastly, we have market data, which covers economic data, non-monetary compensation, and geographic factors, all of which influence decision-making during the career coaching process. First, economic data refers to mainly compensation in, in forms of salary or wages. Here, you can see an example of the ONET occupational database and how they evaluate salary. So you can look at state and local wages, you can look at employment, but all of these trends seek to better inform uh, applicants or, or job seekers who are looking at potential careers. Additionally, you have label, labor market analyses, which evaluate at its most basic level how the needs of employers are met by the skills and uh, attributes of employees. Usually this is done through, through compensation such as salaries or wages, and that is exactly what labor market analyses tend to look at. Lastly, you have the return on, on investment analysis, which as you can see here, shows annual income, 40 year income, total costs and return on investment for varying degrees of education. Now, the issue with this at times can be the lack of a human aspect. This includes access to education. This includes time and money spent on pursuing education, debt from education, uh, personal situations that aren't necessarily uh, factored into this decision. So. While this serves as a guide, it's not necessarily a concrete relationship between return on investment and education. Next, non-monetary non compensation refers to how organizations seek to retain and recruit employees. Uh, benefits such as health insurance, such as dental insurance, paid time off, retirement funds, all are important to consider during the career coaching process because they can influence decision making. They can influence uh, jobs and when jobs are close, they can potentially put one ahead of the other. Perks are similar, but they often have a smaller impact. They can include employee discounts, uh, paid time off or flexible scheduling, which as many people as Robert Half International terms it, icing on the cake. They're not necessarily vital to decision making, but they're important. Next. Job security refers to how employees and companies are stable and how basically the likelihood that a person will lose their job or the unlikelihood that a person will lose their job. And researchers have found that all three generations, baby boomers, millennials, anybody in the workforce right now has found that this is one of the most important non-monetary compensation factors when evaluating jobs. Lastly, personal and professional growth opportunities these are typically thought of as promotions, but they're used by employees to enrich or by employers to enrich employees' lives. These include additional education, uh, online courses, additional training, professional workshops, business retreats, all of which serve to help make an employee's life better in, in personal and professional aspects. Finally, we have geographic factors. You have personal preference, which is small or insignificant or uh, different as these preferences may seem, they provide a huge uh, impact on the decision-making process. So somebody who hates the snow might hate to live in Buffalo, New York for most of the year where it snows an exceptional amount. Uh, on the other hand, somebody who wants to be in warm weather might move farther south. This can overall impact the geography of where a person chooses to pursue a career. Next, you have geographic concentration of occupations. Uh, metropolitan areas are often more focused on service industries, but you also have natural resources that impact where occupations can be found. Uh, data technology, for example, often found in Silicon Valley. Now, Silicon Valley isn't the only place that you can find data technology 
professions, but it's the central hub for it. And for the most part, that's where many of them will be located. Additionally, a marine biologist might have difficulty finding work in St. Louis, Missouri or in Lebanon, Illinois, because they're not located near a major body of water that could help them with their, with their occupation. Lastly, you have cost of living and local tax rates. Uh, this refers to basically how far an earned dollar will go in these different cities. So for example, in Dallas, Texas, a two bedroom apartment might be $1,400, but in San Francisco, California, it's almost three times as expensive. Additionally, local tax rates can increase the cost of living by 50%. The average American household spends around $8,800 a year in taxes, but some local taxes, some state taxes can increase this number by up to three times, making it an important factor to consider. Now, what's next? Like I said, this question is, is unavoidable. It, it follows us throughout our lives and it's, it's difficult to answer, but the career coaching process helps to make the information more manageable, helps to eliminate choices and helps to lead to better decision-making. For me personally, as Professor Ulrich explained, I have decided that I wanna to go to law school and I've used this process to eliminate some things that I, I have decided I don't wanna do and research things that I've found an interest in and help make this information overall more manageable and make it easier on me, make it easier on everybody else to, to start to explain. Now, in all honesty, this is a difficult process. The process of career coaching is, is dull. It, it's not very exciting. It, it's a lot of research, it's time consuming, and it's easy to dismiss. A lot of people don't see it as valuable, but it is valuable because it creates lifelong frameworks for decision-making. It, it's flexible. The rule of three specifically is flexible. You can add, you can take away, you can research different areas. Like I said, the three areas that I have discussed aren't steadfast. There, there are other ways and other areas that can be equally important or even more important during this process. So while the immediate stress of, of researching these jobs and of the career coaching process can weigh on some people, the lifelong benefits are immense and they often outweigh the immediate boredom that comes with the career coaching process. So overall, this career coach, coaching process at its core does a lot of things, but it seeks to answer the question, what's next? And that's why it's most important. Thank you.